Welcome to the Anti-Architect Podcast. I am your host, Christian Giordano. As president and owner of the design firm Mancini Duffy, I am driven by a quest for learning and radically changing the industry. With this podcast, I'm hoping to improve the industry that I'm so passionate about by taking a critical look at how architects work through a variety of voices and shared experiences. Hello, Anti-Architect Podcast listeners. I'm excited to welcome Christopher Walsh, one of the country's top residential real estate agents, as my guest today in studio on the Anti-Architect Podcast. Chris is a real estate mogul and recently left his traditional brokerage company for an even larger opportunity by joining EXP Realty, the largest residential real estate brokerage in North America and the first and only real estate brokerage in all 50 U.S. states. In 2003, Chris made the decision to pursue real estate and quickly revolutionized the industry. Chris's innovative approach to marketing, sales, and social media has led to the sale of nearly a billion dollars worth of real estate and over 1,200 homes, and he has only just begun. Chris's leadership in the industry is informed by his strong relationships combined with his innovative business approach. Together, these personal and communal elements have helped him grow his company, even in the depths of the 2008 financial crisis when nobody was buying homes. By investing in his own agents, Chris trains and supports over 70 top producing realtors. At the same time, he has been fortunate to continue helping his clients buy and sell their homes. Few fun facts. Chris is ranked in the top 1% of overall sales nationwide since 2010. He's ranked number 20 as a top producing agent nationally and number 40 internationally. And he's maintained the prestigious Diamond Award for the Remax organization since 2014. Chris, thank you so much for agreeing to be here on my podcast. I'm really looking forward to having this conversation. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Awesome. So, uh, that was so, quite an intro. <laughs> <laughs> Impressive guy. I think on my way here, I was like, why does this guy want me on here? <laughs> <laughs> so what's interesting is my audience is more on the corporate side. So right. I think it would be fun to have you as the residential broker, yeah, sure. especially kind of what you do, kind of talk to the audience because I think it's a little bit different. And we're going to have some other, yeah. you know, re um, corporate real estate brokers on as well. But sure. but let's get right into it. What, what annoys you about architects? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what doesn't? No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, it's interesting, man. I, I mean... Coming from like the residential component, you know, it's it's strictly function is is you know the top priority when when you're talking about architecture. I, I feel and I feel like there's a major disconnect a lot of times between function and style with hmm. the way that a lot of these architects that are out there, especially like the mass produced product and. Um, you know, even a lot of the custom builders, you know, it's like they'll build something that looks awesome, but the reality is the functionality of it may be, you know, just may not work. Um, I mean, I had uh, I had an example not too long ago where like, you know, beautiful home, three million dollars uh, in the suburbs here where I where I uh, primarily operate. Uh, and just to uh, put things into perspective, we are. You know, my my prime area is about an hour south, about a 50 minute ferry ride uh, directly south of Manhattan. Right. Uh, so we get a lot of the um, majority of the influx from, you know, uh, clientele that are, you know, primarily living in the city and they're looking to, you know, start a family, um, you know, have more space, uh, hmm. you know, live the I guess you could say the American dream. <laughs> And uh, they uh, they moved to where we live, you know, because yeah. you and I both live in the same town, actually. Um, so uh, we get a lot of that, um, you know, that urban type of clientele that want the suburbs. And I think people sort of get this. Uh, they're sort of shocked at the difference between the architecture in Manhattan versus the architecture that they get in the suburbs, not to mention 
a majority of the suburbs, the suburban sprawl that took place back in the 60s, well, 50s, 60s, 70s, and then continued through the 80s. Yeah. You know, I don't know what these guys were like tripping on acid or something <laughs> when they were designing their houses because they are like the poorest designed uh, yeah. homes that I've probably ever encountered, uh, which I find interesting, too, because I feel like when you go to other parts of the country, even now, like present day, you know, you have a lot of these track builders, you know, like your Toll Brothers, your Havnanians, uh, Pulte Homes. I feel like what they build in New Jersey is so much different than what I see being built by the same builders in other parts of the country. And yet it's yeah. more expensive in New Jersey. And then like the that New York, the greater New York metro area, you know, you're paying more for the house and you know, the, the, the designs of them and the materials used even are, you know, that they're just a much lower quality in my opinion. Um, and there's really, I don't know, it, it's just the, the, the creativity is not really there. The, um, you know, the flow is not there. The, just the, you know, the design uh, features just, I feel like are lacking so much, uh, in our area. And I, I really don't get it, but, um, yeah. You know, I'm like waiting for some builder to come out and just build these unbelievably looking homes. Right. You know, they could be the same home, cost the same amount of money, but just designed much better, you know, and, and a lot more <laughs> style going into them. And I feel like they would sell out in a matter of minutes. You know, Well, I got plenty of ideas for that. So you and I will have to talk about that uh, afterwards. So, I mean, so. is it me or do you like? No, I, I totally agree. You know, I was looking at homes down in South Carolina recently, you know, and I actually purchased a home down there and. You know, what I'm seeing down there for, you know, six, seven hundred thousand dollars, you know, it's like blows away these houses that are up in the New York metro area for close to two million dollars. Yeah. So if you take Toll Brothers for and example. And I get the land. I get the land. But like materials cost the same amount of money, don't they? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, yeah. with a little bit of difference. But so if you take Toll Brothers, for example, and you look on their website, the stuff that I totally agree with you, the stuff that they build in New Jersey versus, let's say, their developments in Austin, Texas. Right. Their Austin, Texas developments are unbelievable. They're innovative. The design is modern. And yet you come to New Jersey or even, you know, New York, Long Island, where, where this whole area, right? Connecticut. Yeah. And it's a very traditional And yet I house. feel like the people that are a little more focused forward thinking, people that are a little bit more into innovation, technology, you know, and, and very, uh, I guess, uh, more up to date, you know, with, with current trends and things like that, wouldn't they be coming out of like the, the New York metro I would think area? So, right? Right? Yeah, you would think so, so. I just feel like there's this disconnect where like, you know, the designing and the architecture, it just doesn't really coincide with the clientele. And yeah. it's, it's just so bizarre. Probably 85% of the buildings that are in New York City, people have modern apartments in them. Right. And yet they come to the suburbs and their surrounding areas and they go right to this traditional look, big, heavy furniture. They jettison all their modern stuff. Somehow it just goes right out the window and they become <laughs> this very suburbanite. Uh, it's a bizarre. Uh... So I want to tell a little story about how I met Chris. So um Marketing. Yeah. yeah. Amazing marketing. So Power of marketing. Chris would send out flyers, you know, these very nice postcards with a picture of him in his suit looking all professional. <laughs> and he would always say, you know, what home was for sale or what he recently sold. And for years and years and years, my wife and I got these flyers or, or these, these postcards yeah. in the mail. And they were always stylized very nicely and very, very clean. And, and, and just the photo, the photography was amazing. And so we always said, you know, if we're going to sell our home, we're calling this guy. And then one day we decided, you know what, we're actually going to sell our home. We renovated it for years and years. And then we had the bright idea to just sell it out of nowhere. And so we called Chris. I reached out to Chris on Instagram because I also followed him on that. And uh, Chris sold our house within a few hours of putting it on the market. Yeah, pre-pandemic. That's few right. Pre-pandemic. Exactly. Well, it was also designed by, you know, world-renowned that's architect right. Christian right. Giordano. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, it's a nice house, that's for sure. It was so, awesome. um but uh, but we became friends ever since. So yeah. it's uh, it, it's been a it's been a fun journey to get to know you over the years. Thanks, so tell us a little bit about, you know, your story. Where did you grow up? Um, you know, what did your parents do? A little bit of your childhood. 
Well, I grew up in Monmouth County, uh, northeast Monmouth County, the Bayshore area. I grew up in a little town called Hazlitt, New Jersey. Uh, nothing very exciting going on in Hazlitt, <laughs> New Jersey. Um, went uh, went to school there all, all through my childhood, basically, from the age of uh, five. I originally was born in Jersey City, Hudson County, um, which I actually own a business uh, present day in Jersey City, which is kind of cool. It's a little, you know... Uh, <laughs> getting back to my my grassroots there <laughs> but um yeah so uh moved to monmouth county when i was five and lived in monmouth county up through high school uh in hazlitt actually and then um moved to middletown later on in high school that was my first taste of middletown township which is again where i live uh today uh, as well as yourself yep um and uh you know typical uh upbringing, I guess, you know, my parents, nothing, uh, nothing crazy on their part. You know, my mother went back to school when I was in high school. Um, she graduated from Rutgers. We have a big Rutgers family. Uh, I went to Rutgers university. My <laughs> brother, Brian went to Rutgers university. My mother's a Rutgers graduate, nice. but my mother went back to school when I was in high school. And, uh, so she worked for a school system, uh, nothing to do with real estate. Uh, and my father, my father worked for the utility company, public service, uh, uh, electric and gas. Uh, he worked there for many, many years. He just retired a couple of years ago. And, uh, yeah, so I didn't really have any exposure to real estate growing up. Uh, but I was always into sales, you know, I was always a salesman, always trying to sell everybody <laughs> something, that. you know, <laughs> and uh, I used to put all the kids in the neighborhood to work, you know, and, and, uh, whether it was selling whatever candy, lemonade, you know, uh, whatever. And, um, you know, my, my mother used to always tell me like, you're, you know, you're going to own a business when you get older. And, you know, I just kind of shrugged it off this and that. And then as I like ventured through college, um, and again, I was big into like music. I was big into the music scene. I was, uh, I was a drummer most of my life and, cool. you know, music was, was my thing, you know? So I was really involved in that, that whole scene played, uh, played with a couple bands that, you know, did some really cool stuff. Uh, the last year we played, uh, we did uh, a bunch of showcases out in South by Southwest in, in Austin, um, did uh, a couple other like uh, this thing called the Take Action Tour. We played a couple big, you know, uh, heavier, uh, like we we're like yeah, a melodic, kind of uh, heavy, like hardcore type <laughs> cool. sound. And uh, we played a, a couple of really big festivals that year. And, you know, things were looking really promising. And then I got to tell you, I went down to Miami uh, for a wedding. I had a, a really close friend who was about 10 years older than me and he was getting married. I was only 23 at the time. I went down to Miami, had no thoughts of getting into real estate, went to Miami. Uh, I'm at this like beach, uh, style hotel, this like boutique hotel. I'm at this like tiki bar uh, over on the sand. I'm, you know, I order a drink. I'm watching, uh, whatever game was on. I don't really follow sports, so I, I couldn't <laughs> even tell you, but there's some game on. And I start talking to this guy sitting next to me and it turns out he was there for the same wedding, but he was there for the, for the bride and she was from Miami. Okay. Uh, so we're in Bell Harbor, Miami. I start, you know, striking up a conversation with this, with this guy and um he was a realtor that's what he did um and wound up hanging out with uh this guy his name was brett i wound up hanging out with him for a few days because we're like i said we were down there for a couple of days for this wedding we went out in south beach hung out and you know really cool dude and I, I just got to learn a lot about what he was uh doing for a living and you know he worked with, uh, for some developers and this and that and uh you know i just got a little sneak peek into like how this guy lived and i was like whoa <laughs> like I want to do what this guy is doing. Like it seems so exciting, seems so fun. And I mean, he did tell me like the kind of money he was making. And I was like, wait a second, <laughs> what? <laughs> like really? And um, I actually still stay in touch with him a little bit here and there. But uh, anyway, that was uh, that was my first like light bulb going off. Like I'm going to get into real estate. I came back to Jersey. I got my license. Of course, I knew nothing about the business. Didn't know what a closing even really meant. I had no idea. What's the process of getting a license? It's the entry is very, very low. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> the entry is super low to get a license. You have to go take a course. It's like 75 hours uh, in New Jersey. And then you have to take a test, you know? So I took my test, I got my license, but that's the easy part. Okay. The hard part is, you know, 
even easy as like anybody could get a license, I guess, and sell a couple of houses, which is what I did. I got my license. I sold my first house ever. It was in Keyport, New Jersey. What was it? Do you remember that? 98 Elizabeth Street in Keyport, New Jersey. <laughs> I drive by it sometimes. <laughs> I'm such a creep. I drive by it, you know, and I'm like, I took, I was taking a picture of it the other day and I was like, oh, these people are going to come out of their house. Like, what are you doing? Um, so what was that like selling your first house? It was eye opening, man. It was the epiphany that set me off. Okay. It was, that was like the moment of truth. That was the, um, the like the lightning bolt. So did you life. when you were a kid though? Did you did you want to be something anything in particular? Like I knew I always wanted to be an architect, right? And that's what I became. I, you know, right I now. wanted to be an architect. Oh, time. really? I think I told you that. I think you did. <laughs> I took, like I took drafting or whatever it's called, like in in high school. <laughs> right, right. Um, Good choice on the real estate side, by the way. <laughs> I uh, <laughs> yeah, I I mean, what did I want to be when I was a kid? You know, I I for some reason I thought I wanted to be like. Uh, a marine biologist. I don't know why. I actually, <laughs> I, I went into, I studied science in college. Um, that was kind of random. Um, but then I shifted to economics Okay. Uh, as I ventured through college, realized science. Well, once I had to go into biology and start cutting animals open, I was like, nah, yeah. I'm good. Selling houses I'm good, man. I'll do economics, you know, it's boring, but it's, uh, it's okay. It's just numbers and, and writing. I don't have to cut anything open. Um, so you and sell then, your first uh, house. So I sell my first house, 98 Elizabeth Street, and I was all excited, man. And, you know, back then you have to understand, like real estate, the, the whole landscape of real estate was different. You know, today, everybody watches the shows on TV. I mean, you turn on Bravo and it's like you open up, a, uh, they make it look like you open up a front door on million dollar listing, you know, any of these shows that are on. You start opening up doors for a living and you're going to make a million dollars, you know, and you get to dress nice, wear these suits, cool haircuts and stuff, you know, <laughs> and uh, and it's just like home runs every every time you swing the bat. And it's just not the case. You know, there's a whole other side to that. It, that it's kind of like watching, you know, I don't know. Uh, remember that show House? Yeah. And that's like what the, being a doctor's like. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you just go in a room and tell people like, oh, that guy's got this rare uh, blood disease. I could just tell him by looking in his eyes. <laughs> uh, it just doesn't work like that, you know? And real estate is not what you see on TV. But back then, you have to understand that all of those like mainstream type of pop culture, you know, where real estate is like the cool thing to do, uh, None of that existed. Social media didn't exist at right. the level. I mean, back then we had maybe MySpace. We were just venturing out of Friendster. Remember Friendster? Yeah, yeah like, absolutely. We were just venturing out of Friendster into MySpace, you know, uh, back in 2003. And, uh, you know, Facebook didn't exist. YouTube barely existed. Uh, there was th th there wasn't any like. There, there weren't any places to go look and say like, oh, wow, look at how they're selling real estate. It's a cool thing to do. You know, when I told my friends and my family that I was going to sell real estate after selling that first house, they all looked at me like, what? Like, that's not a real job. Right. You're like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, that's not, you're better off just playing the drums, buddy. You know? And um, I was like, no, I really, like, I just sold the house. You don't understand. I just sold the house. And they were like, yeah, okay, like, good for you. How much did great. you sell that house for? $255,000. I nice. made $2,800. It was the most money I ever held in my hand at one time. I was like, this now, is did insane. Now, did you already work for an agency at that point? So, I worked for an agency. I worked for like a smaller agency. Well, I say smaller. They had about 18 locations at the time, about 400 realtors. And when I walked through that front door the first day, the, the gentleman that hired me, he was probably at the time around 80 years old, <laughs> old school, like suspenders, grease back, white hair, comb in his back pocket, you know, like total, like, like, you know, straight out of like the fifties, you know, and, um, like straight out of like a Jimmy Stewart movie, you know, like, like, ah, nah, see, you know, like that's how he <laughs> talked. He was crazy. And, uh, he hired me and he, the guy loved me. Um, and, uh, he was like, we don't have any young blood like you, you know? And, um, he was so excited to bring me into that company and everybody else that worked there. I was the youngest guy. I was 23 years old. I was the youngest by guy by so many years, like decades. Right. And I remember my first day ever going into work there. I had no idea what I was doing. I pretended like I did. And everybody just kind of looked at me like I had 10 heads. And, uh, 
And I, I just didn't care. I, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. Like I said, I got this lead randomly. I was picking up everybody's like crumbs, you know, anything right. that somebody didn't want to work on. I was just like, I'll take it. I'll take it. And they were like, oh, this kid, look at this kid. He has no, like they <laughs> felt bad for me, you know? Um, and I remember them telling me, cause I was such a hustler and I would hustle and hustle and hustle. And I remember them telling me, you know, if you want to make a lot of money in this world, kid, like real estate's not the place to do it. Really? Yeah. And then they would tell me, don't work. Don't work so hard. You're working too hard. Like you're going to burn yourself out. <laughs> and it's just funny because like here we are 18 years later, I'm still working the same amount. Yeah, you definitely and are. I feel like I'm just getting started, which I, is nuts. Uh, and uh, none of those people, by the way, are still selling real estate. But I feel like these days, like everybody thinks they can sell houses. Everybody. And uh, people have no idea the sacrifice that I made those first five years. You know, the, the first five years I sold real estate, I basically took my entire social life and put it on hold. Um, I rarely dated. I, uh, I never moved back home. Like I moved out when I was 18. Uh, I moved into, oh, that's a whole other story, but <laughs> I lived in the most random weird places, uh, just to not live home. Uh, I just, I don't know. I had this, this like motivation to just be on my own, you know, like, okay. like, or this desire, I should say to be on my own. Uh, so I moved out when I was 18, I lived in this like dingy basement for years, uh, for the first year, um, in a house my brother was living in and, uh, I paid $125 a month Oof, to nice. live in this basement. Oh, it was, it was brutal. <laughs> it's probably thinking back now. It's like, oh, it's probably like mold and all sorts of other weird stuff. But anyway, um, yeah, so I, uh, I just hustled, you know, I got myself a little studio apartment. I worked, worked, worked. Uh, and it was just, again, there was no social media. I, I didn't have any money. You know, the first, uh, I remember saying to myself, the third closing check, I'm going to go get a car. So I went and I bought myself like a really nice car so that at least when I pulled up to people, I looked you the had part. Some credibility. So yeah. I went and bought a couple suits, bought a car. Nice. And I was like, all right, I got myself a nice briefcase. I was ready to go. <laughs> so I was like off to the races and uh, just hustled, you know, I was going to any barbecue I could handing out my cards. I was giving my card out to the lady on the, on the line at the supermarket. I was just everywhere I went, I was just trying to get in front of people, you know, and that's what I realized early on is that it's all about networking. It's all about relationships and, um, and, you know, your brand is your reputation, yeah. you know, and you have to guard it with your life. And uh, I, you know, I've taken a lot of losses over the years um, in business and uh, f because, uh, you know, I chose to make decisions that I knew were the, the right decisions to make uh, in business and to preserve relationships mm -hmm. um, may not have done me, you know, uh, an immediate service uh, at the time, but I realized early on that, you know, your business, especially the type of business I'm in is all about your relationships and, yeah, and repeat customers and, and you know, that if, way, if yeah. you, if you learn how to, you know, cultivate and harvest, you know, very high quality, you know, long-term relationships, um, you know, you, you could, uh, you could meet the right people, you mm -hmm. know, and, and you could, you could have fun while you're doing it. And, uh, you know, it's like my man Zig Ziglar says, like, you can have anything you want in the world as long as you help enough people have exactly what they want in the world. You know, it's like if you give enough people what they need and what they want, you know, it's going to come back to you. And uh, and I truly believe that. And that's how I live. But uh, so real estate was, you know, what wasn't what you think it is uh, today by watching, you know, TV and all. But I definitely will say that the first five years that I operated were uh, a, a major hustle. Um 2007 going into 2008, I decided to go out on my own. Right. Uh, I specifically pinpoint this date because it was a very interesting time. The, uh, the, the crazy real estate market of 2002, three, four, five, six yep. into seven was coming to a very abrupt end. A lot of people didn't realize the end it was coming to. <laughs> I went out on my own. I took all of my savings that I had at the time and I put it into starting my own business. I purchased a Remax territory in Middletown Township. Middletown became, you know, my my uh, eyes were set on Middletown. Like that was the market I wanted to tap into. As you know, it's a very diverse market, 200,000 up to about 20 million. And yeah. I figured like, wow, that's a great market to be in. <laughs> so I set my eyes on that. That's where I wanted to be. 
I bought a, a Remax territory in that area, put all my eggs in that basket, and then boom, market tanked. Um, so that, hold that thought because yep. I want to ask a question. So what does that mean you bought a Remax territory? So I'm used to on the commercial brokerage side, right? The the agents work for whatever, CBRE, JLL, yeah. you know, Cushman, so Wakefield. A lot of those I would imagine are independently owned. Uh, so it's just one giant umbrella, although I don't know for, for a some fact. Are, some are publicly traded, I think. Okay. Yeah. So uh, but they're one company. Correct. Like the company I work for now, EXP, they're a publicly traded company. Um, they're uh, they're traded on the NASDAQ. They are one entity. Okay. So if I'm a me- like if I'm a, an agent for EXP and another guy is an agent for EXP that lives in California at the other side of the country, we both work for the same firm. Got it. Yeah, so that's at, how the commercial. Whereas at Remax, work. Remax was a franchise. Uh, okay. So I purchased a franchise territory. Um, it came with, uh, I bought a pre-existing franchise that was, you know, downward spiraling basically. <laughs> uh, it came with 12 agents, October of 2008 market crashed. I'd say by hmm, March of, uh, 2009, I had two realtors and me <laughs> and it was terrible. Um, and it was just time to get to work. So everything changed, you know, you couldn't sell houses. Everybody was underwater Yep. Uh, because everybody was purchasing with subprime loans. Um, so you couldn't sell houses because the market pulled back about 30, 35%. Everybody was underwater. And um, luckily, through all that networking that I mentioned, you know, I did when I first started out, during, you know, throughout the course of those uh, travels, I guess you could say, I met a gentleman who specialized in distressed property sales. He specialized in short sales. Okay. Now, a lot of people in my industry present day know what short sales are. But back in 2009, nobody knew what a short sale was. Right. It was like Chinese, like foreign language to everybody. Nobody understood it. Nobody knew what it was. And I remembered that this guy that I met was telling me what he did for a living. He was a young guy, hustler, just like me. And he told me he handled short sales. So I reached out to him. I hadn't spoken to him in about a year, year and a half. I said, hey, this is Chris Walsh. Do you remember me? He said, yeah, I remember you. I said, yeah, so-and-so introduced us. Hey, are you still doing those short sales? He goes, am I? Oh, now <laughs> I'm now I'm doing more than ever. Oh, it's, you know, this is exactly, uh, you know, this my wheelhouse. <laughs> so um, I said to him, I said, well, if I can get my hands on a lot of short sales, people that can't sell through conventional and tradi- traditional methods, do you think we could work together? Not only did we work together, but we actually started a business together. I started this little organization called New Jersey Home Solution.org. And I basically serve as short sales for the next three years. And wow. I built a team. I recruited buddies of mine from college, basically, guys I knew from the music scene, to come in and, and I trained them to become realtors. And wow. uh, and today they're actually And is uh, that your partner today? No, it's okay. not my partner today, but it's actually one of the guys, uh, this guy Joe Oz, is actually was my main contact at exp that helped us make the money oh, interesting that made. yeah how that's crazy interesting is that and we did short sales and i'll tell you everybody else was going out of business back then 2009 through 2011 and we were just cranking wow i mean it was nuts so when do you when do you start thinking of yourself as a premier brand and start engaging you know your marketing materials and you know realizing that if you photograph things better than the mm-hmm. next guy, or if you have the right typeface and the right mm-hmm. thickness to a yep. postcard, yeah. So how I'd does say, all that come about? Yeah. So 2013, I, I basically reinvented. So we were getting out of the whole distress market. We were heading more into conventional sales again. You know, all those people that we helped get out of their houses that were underwater were now ready to buy again. Who do you think they called? <laughs> right. All the people that we got into these distressed sales at these good deals, now the market was turning on an upswing. Who do you think they called to sell their houses? Yeah, getting to so the we were just booming with business at that point. And in 2013, I found out that uh, my wife and I were expecting our first child. I had a mini nervous breakdown. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, like, how am I going to do this? And so I hired a business coach. And business coach came to the table and basically said, all right, I'm going to help you take your business 
First of all, I thought my business was incredible. I thought there was like, it needed zero improvement. That's funny because I had hired a business coach a while back and same thing. I thought we were great. And then he basically like, told me we were terrible. This guy chased me. He actually found me. It was just the weirdest timing. Like I was having this like mini breakdown. Like, what am I going to do? My life is over. I'm having a child. My business, I'm going to have to work part time. I meet this guy who starts calling me out of nowhere, you know? And it was just like one of those things where like timing was just perfect. I blew him off for the first, actually I stood him up on our first appointment. Cause that's how thinking back, I thought I had everything like <laughs> tight and that's how disorganized I was. The guy called me, he's like, we're supposed to meet today. And I was like, what, who are you? He's <laughs> like, you didn't put it in your calendar. He's like, man, you need a business coach. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I meet with this guy and he sits me down and we had like a 20 minute consult. He told me what his price was. I was like, yeah, right. I'm going to never pay you that much money to be my business coach. You know, I thought I could be his coach. Right. <laughs> and man, was I wrong? Oh my God. I paid this guy every penny that, uh, he charged, he charged me 30 grand to hire this guy for six months. Okay. And at the time I was like, there's nobody worth $30,000. I'll tell you what, this guy was worth 10 times that amount. Wow. I mean, he changed my business. Wow. Um, so that year, uh, I basically took a step back and that was the year that I really propelled myself into a brand and started getting my brand out there like a real product and a real business. And that's when I took things to like a completely new, new level. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because I was bugging out about having a kid. Uh, so I had my daughter Fiona, she actually just turned eight yesterday. And that next year I basically doubled my business. Oh, wow. Good yeah. for you. And then I've like tripled it since then. Yeah, I'm sure. By implementing all of the things mostly that he taught me back in 2013, because they teach you a lot of these things, right? Like, oh, you have to do this. You have to do this. Delegation was a big one. Yeah. You know, learning how to delegate, but it's not just delegating. It's, you know, building the profile of the people that you need to be able to rely on you know, throughout the course of your the day people that you trust and, you want know, and it's like, and, you yeah. need to have people in the background. My, my business is like a seven day a week business. So yeah. you need to have people that basically have no life working for you. <laughs> <laughs> so you can just call them at any given time and be like, I need this. And no, but I have like amazing people that work for me. My main uh, girl, Joanne, she's, she's incredible. She's been with me uh, for 14 years now. Wow. And uh, she really stepped her game up back then. And, uh, you know, she, uh, she's been a huge asset, but, you know, learning how to delegate, learning how to manage your time, time management, you know, these are the things that I teach my agents constantly is, uh, you know, time management, working your calendar, delegating. Um, and a lot of people have a lot of trouble with that. And I think that's really what separates like that upper echelon, like that, that premier business person from the rest mm -hmm. you know you, the only way you're gonna like you need to have like multi, like how many times do you say to yourself like i need a clone of me oh absolutely you yeah. Know? yeah absolutely well, obviously that can't happen because nobody's gonna be you right the next best thing is having people that you can rely on yeah so that you could double down triple down quadruple down your efforts Correct. to have that much more output. Yeah, like I, I have amazing partners and I have an amazing support staff and then that's what elevates, you know, me to be able to, and, and, yeah. and my partners to be able to do what yeah. they do as well. I mean, that was another thing too. I brought a partner on in 2016, which took a, uh, cause you know, the dynamic of my business really is, uh, you know, I have my personal business. Like I, at the end of the day, I'm just a realtor. I'm mm -hmm. just a real estate agent. That's what I do. Well, so that's what I was going to say. So you delegate, but you also do plenty of your own real estate. I mean, sure. you, you showed my house when we yep. sold. I mean, you were the guy. You didn't yeah. pass it off to another agent. No, I, I mean, know you're and out I there. love that and I'll never give that up. <laughs> um, but I, I am a real estate agent. I mean, for all intents and purposes, like I'm a realtor. I just, I've figured out ways so that I personally can sell, you know, 100, 120 houses a year with ease. And it gives me the ability, like I, I'm a partner in, you know, other businesses as well. Oh, like, yeah, I want to talk about that too. Yeah. So. <laughs> and um, so, you know, and I, I run into people all the time, like agents primarily who they stress out, they're selling 20 houses a year and they're like stressed out beyond belief. They don't know how to manage their time. And I'm like, and they'll ask me like, how do you, how do you, how do you do all this? 
Right. And to be honest with you, I feel like I have a lot of free time. Like I could do more, Wow. you know, and it's, you know, I mean, I'm here right now, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm wondering what we're doing after this. That's, right. <laughs> That's great. It's not but, late in the day just to go out and get a but, drink. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it, anyway, like 2013 was the, the year that I really propelled my business to that next level. Okay. Um, because I, I, I was more of a, I felt like I was like, I don't know. I was, I was hustling and I was, I was servicing all, all of my clients, but I wasn't really running a business, you know? And yeah. then that's when I realized it was all about the brand, the product. And like, that is what I really needed to push. I almost disassociated myself in a way from the Remax brand. You know, I, I would basically align myself with Remax for compliance reasons, you know, whatever the state requirements were, because they do have certain rules and, and things like that. But for the most part, I was pushing my brand, my name, you know, I'm the guy. And, uh, well, when I reached out to you, I didn't know you were with Remax. I right. just thought you were your own brand. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I hired a, like an ad agency, um, a, a marketing agency who specialized in, you know, strategic brand marketing and all that. And the owner, uh, happened to be, a, uh, happens to be a really good friend of mine. And, you know, we sat down and I got to pick his brain and he is like the creative mind behind that company. And, uh, he was able to give me a lot of his, you know, direct one-on-one -on -one attention. And we came up with this you know, really cool concept to roll with. And, uh, you know, it, it just worked. And no, it's funny because I didn't really see anybody else doing that kind of thing right. at the time. You know, this is eight years ago. I didn't really see many realtors doing that kind of thing. So I was a little like, I don't know, like, I don't know. I wasn't one to have this like ego where I'm like, oh, I got to put my name out there. I got to put my, and he was like, no, you got to do it. You got to do it. And then I showed it to the business coach that I had been working with. And he was like, oh my goodness. Like, that is amazing. You got to do this. You got to do it. It was just my name, like really big on yeah. this thing, you know? But and I worked, was like, whoa. Yeah. And, um, but the, uh, the marketing agency was like, no, nah, this is really cool. And so I rolled it out and man, did people notice it, you know? And it's funny because shortly after that, I started seeing a lot of agents yeah. starting to try and create their own brand and sort of following in the footsteps of that. And, you know, I thought that was pretty cool. You know, some people were like, oh, that's, you know, they're, they're copying your stuff. And I was like, no, my, my coach was like, dude, that's the it's, biggest it's form of flattery. Absolutely. Like, you know, I think, um, who is it? Coco Chanel said, uh, yeah, if you plan on being, uh, if, if you plan on being original in this world, you know, uh, or if you want to be original in this world, plan on being copied. Copied. Yeah, you exactly. Know? And then I, I read something else that says, uh, don't worry about when people are copying you. Worry about when they stop. <laughs> exactly. That's a good point. Yeah. So let me ask you this. So um, something I always wanted to ask, do, does every, when you, when you walk in to sell somebody's home, does everybody love their house and think that it's 10 times better than it actually is? <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. It's like, yes and no. I mean, <laughs> I get some people that it's almost like the human, right? Some people think that they are just the best looking people in the world, right? <laughs> and then sometimes you get like that beautiful person that is just so self-conscious about themselves. And they're like, I'm so ugly. Oh, God. And you're like, Jesus, you're not ugly. Like, you're beautiful. Right. Um, it's very similar with houses, man. You go into houses sometimes and people are walking you through like, like this right here. Chris, are you, are you looking? Chris, <laughs> this is pure oak. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, from 1976. <laughs> but it's like, this is pure oak, Chris, you know, hand milled work, you know. And um, but then you go in other houses that are just awesome. And like your house. I mean, you go to the house like yours, like, yeah, I knew your house was sick. I could see it. I mean, I'm like, this house is insane. <laughs> and, you know, and but I remember I was like, and uh, you show yeah, me no, this it's house. Nice, but like, I don't know if people are going to like you're it. like, you're like, yeah, like, you think I could sell it for X? And I'm like, what? X. What? <laughs> I'll buy it for X. Come on. You know? And uh, for all of those of you guys listening here, this guy had probably my favorite, uh, definitely one of my favorite homes uh, that I listed uh, in all my career. Um, this guy's house was insane. Man, um, making me regret selling it. But uh, <laughs> you make me regret not buying it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you, you know, you go into a house that somebody's put their heart and soul in. 
And uh, just because they put a lot of effort into it doesn't mean that other people are going to find it. Right. It's not going to be received that way among the general public because, you know, you go into some people's houses. I will tell you this. I've seen some crazy, crazy stuff. I'm sure. Crazy. What's <laughs> like, the craziest? Dude. Oh, my God. Well, t- t- to finish your question. <laughs> yes. There are a lot of people that think their house is the best house. Um, especially in this market right now that we're in because it's a quote unquote seller's market. So you have a lot of folks that, you know, I put five listings on the market on Thursday. I have another five coming on this Thursday, right? I put five houses on the market on Thursday and the average I'm getting over list price on these houses, I'd say average is about five to 7%. Wow. Over list price. Wow. Out of the five, Four out of five, actually one guy got about 25% over his list price. He's pretty psyched. <laughs> um, but the other the other folks that are getting like 5%, 7%, I mean, they're bummed out. <laughs> they're like bummed out. That's ridiculous. And these prices, the list prices are about 25% more than they would have been, they been yeah. pre-COVID, pre-COVID pandemic. You know, and it's just like, wow. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, it's just crazy. But anyway. So you want to know the most bizarre thing I have ever yes. experienced? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, you know, I think people get they get so carried away sometimes with the things they're doing in their homes. And you got to remember, like I deal with residential real estate, so there is this personal, yes, and emotional component to it all that you don't see in other, you know, sectors of real estate in the in the world right yeah so i have a lot of friends that do commercial uh they're commercial brokers they hear the things that i deal with and they're like how do you how do you deal with that i mean you're a realtor you're like borderline interior designer (laughs) you're a marketing guy you're a shrink definitely um you know you have to like harness all of these different moving parts and just sort of like you know corral it all together right um, I'd say the craziest thing though, do you, do you know that pink like styrofoam insulation stuff yeah. that you buy? Not the fluffy stuff, yeah. but like the boards yeah. that you buy? Okay. Rigid insulation. Okay. So <laughs> there was this guy who <laughs> he lives not too far away from where we live. Okay. Um, he has a big house, about 8,000 square feet. Okay. And I start running into him because I had another house listed on his street. He's telling me all about his house, how he's got, how he's doing the, all these custom moldings in his house and like all this stuff. And I'm like, wow, sounds pretty crazy, you know? So um, he's got this guy, you know, that he's got doing uh, all this like custom carpentry work in his house. And he's, but he's doing it very, very over the top, like gold dipped, um, trim and all this stuff like that like i don't know it's something that maybe he's trying to market it to like an arabian prince i don't (laughs) know but like something very over the top you know that you would find like in some foreign land somewhere i I don't know but anyway he finally invites me over to his house to see his house i'm like very excited to come see it um and by the way this is just a story that pops in my head i don't know (laughs) but i go to his house this guy has a whole operation set up in his great room of his house okay where he basically just kind of gave up paying the carpenter to do the trim in his house so instead he's just got i go in his house he's got like a face mask on and he's just got like i mean probably 150 empty cans of like that Krylon spray paint, you know? Yeah. And it with those gold caps on the top. So this guy basically just decided that he was going to do his whole house using that pink styrofoam board and he was spray painting it all gold. Beautiful. (laughs) In his house. You should have seen this thing. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. He was basically decking his house out with gold painted styrofoam. (laughs) That's awesome. <laughs> and, he, and he's going to like sell his house, you know, with gold paint, painted styrofoam. I mean, that is, I don't know. Hey, maybe there's a buyer out there for <laughs> I don't that. know. I was like, That's I was like what are you doing? <laughs> so explain to me your new venture with EXP yeah. and what, what does that platform offer for you? So 
Um, under the Remax umbrella, my, so I brought a partner on in 2016, but under the Remax brand, I guess you could say, um, as being the, you know, the, the umbrella that we were aligned with. Okay. So of course I use my personal brand to market, to generate like direct inquiries and, and what have you, and become a name like, you know, within like the seller community. But a lot, a lot of the agents that are out there are affiliated with larger umbrellas, larger brands. So for me, that affiliation was Remax, right? Okay. Um, I'd say in 2019, myself, my partner, his name's Christian as well, <laughs> myself, my partner, and two other pretty big Remax broker owners. Uh, one guy is up in uh, Central Northern Jersey. Another guy is down in Southwest Jersey. Um, we got together. We started a title insurance company. We all kind of knew of each other through the Remax network, um, just from doing like all the broker council events and things like that. And we started a, a title insurance company. And then we all started getting to talk about possibly doing like a joint venture together and merging all of our agencies. Um, we've averaged about, I don't know, 65 to 70 uh, top producing agents within my company over the last, I'd say, three or four years. And those other guys had similar, maybe a little bit bar uh, larger uh, agent count uh, brokerages. So we all been talking about possibly doing something. Then um, fast forward, title company that we started doing really well. And then we were talking about possibly doing something and pandemic hit. Okay. Now, during the pandemic, uh, well, I, at the very beginning of pandemic, I'd say March of 2020, I started hearing stories that there was a pretty large brokerage out of uh, mostly based out of Manhattan, but they're located in Manhattan, LA, Miami. Uh, they just, uh, ventured into Texas. I don't know if you know who they are, but, uh, they're a very big company. Right. Um, and, uh, mostly focused on like those urban Metro areas. And, um, I had heard that they were looking to venture into New Jersey and roll out into like the suburbs, especially since pandemic hit and a lot of people were fleeing the city. Right. Um, I th guess they thought it was a strategic move. So I made a couple calls, reached out to some people I knew that were, uh, affiliated with the company and uh, might possibly have a direct line of communication with the CEO. They did. Uh, make a long story short, I was able to line up a, a, a meeting, an actual in-person meeting with the CEO of this company up in Manhattan uh, early on in pandemic. I'd say we're talking probably April, okay. late April. And uh, met with him and I pitched him on why we would be the, the right fit to be that vehicle to roll out their name in New Jersey. And we were, again, just looking for something new. You know, we felt like the Remax brand, Remax was great for many, many years, but we just felt like we sort of outgrew our place there. Mm. And we, we just wanted something different, right? So anyway, we worked out a deal with this company for myself and the other two brokerages. Uh, it was a really pretty deal. There was an acquisition uh, portion and then a licensing deal that coincided with that where we'd roll out their brand in Jersey over the course of five years. And then we'd work out some kind of sure. uh, purchase back from them um, down the road. And uh, I'll tell you, over the next like three or four months that we were talking to them, I just started seeing like the world changing around us. Yeah. Everything was changing. Yeah. I mean, the way we were communicating was changing. The behaviors were changing. You know, everybody was freaked out about coming into the office, even though real estate agents were deemed essential. Yeah. Nobody wanted to come to the office, to the workplace. I'd say still today, people are a little weird. I agree. About coming back to the office. So because of that, everybody, all of this change was forced. I mean, we saw it happening in corporate America. Everybody was working remotely, yep. you know? Um, and then that's when the needs of the clientele started changing. People were moving out of the area. And I just saw that there was going to be this major push toward virtual communication, virtual learning, you know, virtual employment, like everything was going to be able to be done remotely. You know, Zoom stock was going through the roof. Like you just saw it everywhere. Yeah. Right. And it sort of brought me back to start thinking, like, are we making the right decision for the future? You know, this seems like the right decision for right now, rolling out this company 
into Jersey, but is that where the future is? And so I started talking to a couple other guys that I am very friendly with, uh, bringing things back to that 2009 venture. Uh, one of the guys that I brought in, one of my college buddies, uh, had basically ran with the whole real estate business that uh, that I got him into, and he's now operating out of uh, Orange County, California, and he's with EXP. Right. And um, I sort of circled back with him, and I was kind of keeping him abreast of like everything we had going on with with the move. And you know, he was the one that was like, "Listen, EXP is by far like the most tech savvy, advanced." you know, most innovative cutting edge company that not only exists, but like has ever existed in the real estate world ever and probably will ever exist. It's kind of like they took, you know, I, I compare. Um, so there's a company called Keller Williams that did something yeah. similar to what EXP made way better okay. and has now done. And some people will compare the two companies, but I tell people that's like comparing Facebook with MySpace. Okay. Like <laughs> Facebook yeah, I mean, they kind of took what MySpace was doing. Right. But, but MySpace not is even not even comparable. Yeah. Right. Um, I think MySpace solved So, what does EXP, EXP offer? That's so, EXP basically gives us the ability to, you know, from where I was coming, like, my whole thing was like, I want to learn how to, I, I want to basically get, you know, not my message, but I, I've been trying to help realtors over the years and the realtors that I have been able to help over the years because everybody wants to get into the business, right? But like I said, the entry is very low, but actually turning it into a business is very difficult to do. I'm sure. But if you have guidance and if you have like solid resources and people you can go to, you know, then it becomes possible. Sure. So my whole thing is like, I got into the business 18 years ago. I've, you know, done a lot of things that were a little crazy, you know, to, to get myself in front of certain people and places and, you know, opportunities. And I've learned a lot of really valuable lessons, you know, and I feel like I have this like encyclopedia, you know, of knowledge. And my whole thing is like, I've always tried to give it back to the agents that I bring into the business That's great. in like a condensed version yeah. so that they could do what I did in 18 years. They could do it in three years if they do the right things. Good right? for you. That's great. So I always wanted to like, and everybody that I've given that to has done really well with it, all the agents. But I kept saying to myself, like, there's got to be a way that I could help more agents, right? And EXP gives you the ability to do that because their whole platform is a digital platform. They are one entity, unlike the franchise sure. model where everybody's individually and independently owned and operated. They don't operate any brick and mortar locations. So they're like the Uber of real estate, okay? Um, their overhead is extremely low, relatively speaking to your traditional companies like a, like a Coldwell Banker or right. something like that where they have a location on every major highway yeah. in every city across the country yeah, that seems pretty outdated you know it's very outdated <laughs> so this company is able to give back to their agents right so even for the agent that is only able to sell let's say three or four or five houses because it's just not their cup of tea there's other you know revenue sources and profit centers that the company provides through their innovative model so the agents are put on a much higher and more aggressive compensation plan the agents have the ability to expand and grow and recruit other agents in under them, uh, or we like to use the word attract other agents under them. Um, and they're able to uh, basically grow, you know, in an exponential growth model, because for every person you bring in, that then brings in a person that then brings in a person, you actually will make residual, oh, really? uh, uh, residual revenue based on those expanded recruiting efforts and you get paid seven generations down. Oh, wow. Which is crazy. Yeah. So for a guy like me, I was like, wow, this is like such an awesome sort of like reciprocal, like dynamic here where I can help all these agents. Yeah. And what's in it for me is as I expand and if I bring in, you know, three or 400 realtors direct that, that name me as their EXP sponsor, I'm going to help all three or 400 of those agents become top producers. And then they're going to tell their friends about it and they're going to bring in another, you know, seven and or eight hundred. And then up. they'll, and everybody could keep 
like, so I'm helping these agents utilize that revenue share component awesome. because they could leverage me as like the source of knowledge, right? So those agents could just be like, hey, you got to come to EXP, hear what I'm hearing, learn what I'm learning from this guy. And they could just kind of <laughs> like bring people back to me and I'm the educator. And yet they get to recruit and benefit off of their own recruiting efforts. And they're, you know, it's, it's all about giving value, man, and, yeah. and giving value back. And, you know, if you give enough value out there, you know, then enough people will pay attention. And then even though it's a small benefit from each of those you know, individual agents, like it all adds up. So it's Hell like yeah. a win-win for everybody. That's amazing. And that's the innovation of it all, you know, where no other platform has ever offered that. Yeah. No, I, so, I think about a Caldwell Banker and they really do have locations everywhere. And who would go there? Everywhere. In obvious, it, now I wouldn't even say in this day and age because it's been around for quite a while. Most people start out on the internet looking at yeah. real estate. So what's the point of the of the physical locations. Yeah. So part of what we do here is take a critical look at how um, the architecture profession works. And in your case, kind of how architects work with residential, you know, real estate agents. Um, so I, I guess in, in your opinion, you know, what do architects do well? What do they do wrong when working with, with, a, with a real estate agent such as yourself on the residential side? You know, I'm trying to think to like, I'm trying to think to the the architects that I've actually had direct relationships with, you know, mm -hmm. and um, again, you know, I think the biggest thing, like I, a couple of like the last few new constructions, even that um, that I've represented, you know, some of the architecture. And these were different architects too. That's the thing. It wasn't just like one architect that, right. that I'm talking about. But again, I feel like a lot of these architects, they they lose sight of like the style, you know, element of things. And or, you know, they they're I don't think the full scope of the functionality is really like I've seen very large houses being built. Yeah. And then I go in the master bedroom. And the closet, yeah, the walk-in closet is tiny, right? You know, and I'm thinking to myself, wait a second, <laughs> this is going to ruin the whole deal, right? Yeah, it's true. I mean, something like, and, and sometimes they're unfixable problems. I mean, I guess nothing's truly. Unfixable. But there is such a thing as too big of a room, and I've seen a lot of yeah, really, you know large sure, construction houses sure. where the living room is way. I, I, we have a friend who's got. You know, a, a living room that's so large that they have two different sectionals in there and it still looks empty. Like it mm -hmm. just there's a point in which I just don't understand why you're doing that. Well, it's funny because I will tell you some of these, um, you know, track builders or whatever you want to call them, these these national home builders that are building these homes. Um, you know, I actually went and looked at a, a new construction community that was being built and uh, the designs of the homes actually look pretty good. They look pretty cool. But um, I noticed that the models that they show you, you know, and then the actual floor plans of the of the the standard built model that they're going to give you, you have no choice but to expand the rooms. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's like brilliant. <laughs> they're like, yeah, this is the house. And you're looking at it and you're like, well, there's no way I can live in it like the way it is like that's too small so yeah. like you're forced to to expand you know and i guess that's where they, <laughs> they get you with the upgrades but um yeah I, I you know too large of a room you know the the disproportion um i mean everything has to be somewhat consistent yeah right and but i also think that they don't take into consideration mm -hmm. some of these architects like i mean i don't know maybe it's not their job to, to take this into consideration, but like sometimes they don't take into consideration like the area that they're building in, mm -hmm. you know, they build something that geographically just doesn't fit with the composition of the surrounding areas. Yeah. You know, they build something that just looks like it landed from outer space yeah. in, in, in the context. Yeah. I, no, that I, is the architecture. Right around the corner from where I live, there's a house being built and I'm like, wait a second, this house doesn't belong here. It belongs two towns over. It's a nice house, just not where it is. So what sells as far as architecture goes in, from your view, you know, what are people really looking for in the, in their architecture? 
or do they not know? <clears throat> I don't think people know necessarily, but I will tell you that a lot, like what's in right now is that, you know, that sort of transitional look that, that like coastal, but like that country, it's like that country shore look, mm. you know, I don't know about the rest of the, the country necessarily, but I feel like that style is popular everywhere I go. Okay. You know, you see a house like that being built and that's what I don't understand is why don't, why these architects don't just build like, like that type of house. It's like, why would they even build a house that looks like it's an institution? Mm. this day and age like that yeah. was popular back in 1997 yep you know everybody wants that like soft looking that coastal sort of like hampton style home yeah you know like the dutch colonial sort of you know front to it right yep. you know, yeah, yeah that farmhouse style yeah with the shakes and, yeah, yeah with the shakes or like that hardy plank yep um you know and like just kind of cool stuff like that I, I feel like you could pick up any copy of like you know, any of these architectural magazines or like Lux magazine or, or one of these, you know, magazines of like that, that New York Hamptons East Coast or, or that West Coast uh, even. And you could just look through any of those magazines and know what's, what's right. in style. Now, do you use any of the technologies like the walkthroughs? Um, you know, we use it in our office called Matterport. Yeah, so it's, it's funny that it. uh, it's funny that you say that because I was actually going to talk to you after this podcast <laughs> about something that I need to pick your brain on uh, on something. I have a new construction uh, development that uh, that I was just called into uh, twenty luxury townhomes uh, over by the beach in Long Branch Township uh, nice. or the city of Long Branch, whatever. And um, they are actually looking for something very similar, like a video tour walkthrough, not a Matterport. But then again, maybe I don't know. Okay. I don't technically use Matterports right now. Okay. But I also don't know what the Matterport is really doing present day. Like, I don't know. I mean, it creates basically a virtual walk. Right. Yeah. Right. But that's got to exist already. So it's if it doesn't exist. exist, yeah, it's a different, it's a different technology. Yeah. So the so. one I'd be talking about doesn't exist. Cool. <laughs> that's even better for me. So I don't, you know, I don't do the Matterport. Like most of what I do these days are videos of something that exists. Okay. So instead of doing the Matterport, I'm doing videos. Right. You know, like I, have a, I have a videographer that'll come out and he'll do a video of a property that currently exists. Right. It's just easier, in my opinion, it's easier to to put that out there on social media. It's easier to s chop it up and make ads with it. Yeah. Um, makes sense. There's whereas, less post-production with it too. It's just, yeah. it is what it is. That's, yeah. uh, any other opportunities you see for technology in the, in the residential architecture uh, world? Any opportunities for technology? Give me an example. Like, well, things like, uh, you know, we would do renderings for it, right? Mm -hmm. And it kind of, you know, makes it, look, you makes it look real nice. <laughs> or virtual reality. Does virtual reality kind of help sell wow. things? Do you see people realistically, you know, putting on a headset and doing a walkthrough? I don't know. Do you? Uh, not, we, we do it in the corporate side because yeah. they're massive. They're massive build outs, yeah. you know, hundreds of thousands of square feet and it does work. Uh, or we do it in a more intimate setting, like a restaurant, right? Where the, the owner of the restaurant really wants to understand kind of what the seating arrangements are, what the look and feel is going to be like. Yeah. Um, but I could see on the, re the residential side, it's probably too expensive to do, you know, right off the bat. Yeah. Um, but I also don't see potential homeowners really realistically putting a headset on and, <laughs> and walking around, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm I'm curious to see like what types of things are, are going to start hitting pretty soon, you know, as, as far as uh with real estate goes. I mean, there in my world, I think more like the technology is coming on the side of like, you know, a lot of these companies have gotten try to get off the ground where they eliminate the need for a realtor. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Like they're trying to eliminate the whole hand hand holding concept right of real estate and although that does sound like something that could take a little bit then there's this whole other side yeah where i don't think that would ever really take off because right you know i don't think homeowners like people coming in their home unaccompanied they're like just some random person that can go on to like one of these weird, you know, startup tech 
startup companies and just get access to their house. Right. That just seems a little too invasive. Yeah. I you know, agree. and I don't know if there's ever anything that's going to make that okay. There's always that for sale by owner thing, but you when you really break down the statistics, those that that actually use an agent end up selling their house for more and ultimately right. end up with more money in their yeah. pocket. So it really does make sense. So last couple of questions. So yeah. um tell us a little bit about, you know, one of the things I love about you is that, you know, you started very humbly selling one home, but you've grown that into other businesses. So tell us a f mm -hmm. a, about a few of the other businesses you have, specifically the restaurants. Yeah. So I am a, uh, I'm an active partner in um, a few bar restaurants uh, throughout Monmouth County. Mostly uh, we, I'm partner of a bar restaurant also in Hudson County in Jersey city. Uh, it's called Hudson hall. It's a European style beer hall slash restaurant. Um, we actually, uh, you know, tried to create a very authentic, uh, <laughs> rustic, you know, European style um, uh, establishment. Uh, it's all indoor, although we do have a lot of outdoor seating now since COVID sure. with uh, everybody taking their their restaurants outdoors, basically. Um, but uh, it, the one in Jersey City is pretty cool. Um, it's not a German beer garden like our Asbury location, Asbury Park. We do have the uh, Asbury Fest Hall and Beer Garden. Uh, I'm actually the head partner of, of that, myself and my uh, my partner, Rich. Uh, we are the head partners of Asbury Fest Hall. Uh, and then I am the managing director and managing partner of, of that location. Awesome. Um, that does have an outside. So that's about... Uh, we have about 10,000 square feet indoors, and then we have a 5,500 uh, square foot rooftop. Which is awesome. Well. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. great up there. I, I'm sorry, 7,500 square foot rooftop Okay, uh, there as well. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my, my guys hear that, they'll be like, dude, 7,500. <laughs> um, yeah, we're open year round, all the restaurants. And then we also have uh, Atlantic House in Atlantic Islands and Ocean House in Seabright, New Jersey. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. It's, it's, so it, it's all different concepts a little bit, but, um, you know, it's very cool. And any of them you can eat and get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so bring it all back around. Uh, if you had to do it differently, as far as your career, would you change anything? <laughs> would I change anything? Um, well, um, I don't know, you know, I, I don't live a life of regret, man. You know, I, I like to just, Anything that I look at that I say, hey, you know what, like maybe it could have been better. I mean, I'm blessed, man. I'm, I'm very grateful that I met that gentleman on the beach back in 2003. Yeah. Because I'll tell you, like I had that light bulb go off. And uh, had I met him in 2008, my life would not be what it is today. It's great. You know, and uh, I don't live a life of regret, man. I look at things and I see what it is. And because guess what? I could have never met that guy at all. Yeah. I could have not known the guy that got married down in Miami. I could still be a drummer in a band right now. Who still knows what that cool would have been though. like? <laughs> so, you know? well, Chris, thank you so much for being my guest here on the Anti-Architect Podcast. Um, you know, thanks for sharing a bit of your world. Thanks for having and, me. And uh, especially for your friendship over the years. Thank so, you. Uh, no, it's... Normally I give like plugs, but you have so many things. So why don't you tell us about <laughs> your website, your Instagrams so and all that sort of stuff? Because I'll, I'll screw it up. Uh, yeah. So, um you could you could catch me on Instagram. Uh, you could follow me at the Real Estate Leader. Uh, it's just at the Real Estate Leader. I'm also on Facebook. Feel free anytime. You, uh, I receive and respond to DMs all the time. My Facebook is Chris Walsh, Premier Realtor, and my website is just www.therealestateleader.com. Also, I host a podcast slash Zoom. Uh, where I invite real estate agents on to um, hear different topics every week. We do that Tuesdays, Eastern Standard at 2 p.m. And it's called Leader's Edge. And uh, I typically have guest appearances from other top producing agents from around the country. And um, yeah, so check me out there, Leader's Edge podcast, Tuesdays, 2 p.m. And follow me at The Real Estate Leader. Awesome. Thank you so much again. Thanks for having appreciate me. Appreciate it. Really appreciate it.